Hello and welcome to Under the Surface. I'm Annalie Maley and today we have a wonderful guest with us in Monique Conti. Um, I'm very excited to have you here. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have a good chat. Um, we were just before we started talking about how you hear absolutely everything in these things. Yes. So we might you might hear some tapping noises and some little, yeah, that's, that's the vibe. That's what we're going for. Um, so today was an off day for you. Talk to me about what you get up to on your off days. My off days, um, I don't actually get up to every, anything at all, um, <laughs> but sometimes that's the best for us athletes, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because we're so busy and we're always doing something throughout the day, um, having an off day to do nothing is some, sometimes what we need mentally mm-hmm. and physically. Um, yeah, so today I got my nails done. Important. Blue. Do we like them? Yeah, I, I do like them. That's a nice colour. I don't usually get colour. Um, yeah, I got my nails done, had to catch up with someone, um, grab a coffee and hung out with my puppies. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the puppies. Here. Tell us about the puppies. They are two sausages. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> They're so overweight. It's hilarious. They're one fat of them has sausages. Like, <laughs> fat sausages. And one has a dummy that just drags and it's very concerning for a, a physical health. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I blame my mum for that. She overfeeds them. Yeah, fair. Um, yeah, so they're great, um, living their best life, eating every day. Um, yeah, they're like one and one and a half, Ziggy and Miri. Miri is the girl, Ziggy's a boy. Nope. And they are my personality. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Literally, I say, like, um, we'll get the camera on to show eventually. I've got my dog here with me today. He's um, blending into the carpet as a black puddle. Um, <laughs> I am trying to get us to the place where this is a very dog-friendly place and everyone brings in their dogs every time we do an episode. I feel that would be amazing. Well, next time in a couple of weeks when I come back, <laughs> yes. I'll bring my puppies in. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Um, so just to give people an overview, everyone knows who Mon is anyway but you are a dual athlete you do you do both you do the basketball and the footy and give us a a little bit of a blurb about who you are as a sporting person a blurb a blurb a blurb (laughs) give us a blurb (laughs) um I am (laughs) just mon (laughs) yeah um yeah I don't know I guess my whole life I've just been an athlete um, obviously more than that, but yeah. I guess I'm known as being an athlete, which is fine for me. Um, yeah, play basketball and I play FW as well. Um, I'm busy 12 months of the year. I never get a break and currently playing WNBL and will have a little bit of a break for the first time in like two years. So I'm really excited for that. And then straight into footy preseason. So, um, yeah, for me, it's just go, go, go all the time, but it's fun. I would like to get into the management of some of that, but I would first like to rewind all the way back. Um, I want to ask you as a kid, how would people describe Lil Mon? Tiny, <laughs> literally an ant or a rat, whatever. Um, <laughs> a rat ant, yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, little Mon, um, I was definitely really active as probably most of us were. Um, I always gave it a crack. Like it doesn't matter what it was, I was doing it and so competitive. I think growing up with an older brother, you would know as well. Like you're just so competitive and wanting to do whatever they wanted to do. So that was me. Um, I, I think one of the first books I read according to my mum was the dictionary. (laughs) So I just try to be a bit different yeah, and I thought yeah. I was really smart, but I, I was just average. Um, and yeah. <laughs> the dictionary. She came in my room one day. She's like, what are you reading, Mon? I'm like, the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine little ant rat Mon reading yeah, a dictionary. The dictionary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just really happy, active, hyper, um, and, yeah, that's just probably how I am now is pretty much how I was then. <laughs> yeah, fair. So how many siblings do you have? I have a 27 or 28-year-old brother. <laughs> One of the two. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, ballpark, ballpark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that works. Nathan, shout out, hi. Um, <laughs> and a 14-year-old sister, so I'm the middle. Middle child, yep. same. Yeah, same. We're definitely not the favourite. It's fine. We're a vibe. Yeah. We're absolutely a vibe. So um, you as like a little personality and school and stuff, did you get up to much trouble? Like what, what were, you a, were you a a bad kid or were you just, you know, too smart for your own good? If we're comparing each other, I was <laughs> an angel. Oh, and I- right, right, right. <laughs> no, I'd never got up to anything bad. Um, 
I, yeah, I kind of followed the rules but wasn't, like, dorky. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I had friends. <laughs> <laughs> I was devil spawn, so the reason I asked that is because I have this theory that middle children are always devil spawn, but you just kind of ruined that for me. That's yeah, um, well, it depends what we're talking about, but I think my my young sister, Gabby, she's evil in yeah. her own way. It's like, again, like, we've never gotten up to anything bad, and I don't know if that's because it's just mum is sort of quite lenient, lets yeah. us do things that isn't too strict to the point where we want to rebel. Yeah. Um, but, no, I never got up to anything bad. Um, I probably told my mum everything anyway, so <laughs> I was quite innocent. Oh, okay, so no stories there. <laughs> Sorry. That's totally fine. Um, how did you get into sport initially? So was that your brother's influence or, or was it kind of through school and was it footy first or was it basketball? Um. My both my parents were sporty parents. I guess I grew up playing sport. Um, my mom did like everything. She did like diving, trampolining, running, random. soccer, volleyball. <laughs> wow. Random. Yeah, I haven't done any of those. <laughs> um, my dad was football, volleyball, mm-hmm. and I don't know if he played soccer or not. But um, so we used to go and watch my brother play football. And dad would just be kicking the ball with me on the sidelines and didn't realize I was good at kicking the ball until someone commented and said, hey, she can kick. He's like, oh, great, whatever. Yeah. And then I had like lots of boys at school that were like playing locally or whatever. So I wanted to just go play with them and that's how I got into it. And probably because my brother and basketball, the same thing. You just go watch him play and wanted to try play. So I just did that. So probably just copied my brother and my parents were sporty so they were like all for um, me doing sport. But they never forced um, uh, me, my brother and my sister to do anything. It was like if you want to, we'll do it. Yeah. But tell us if you don't so we don't waste our time and money. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So that was it, yeah. So at that time I I could be wrong here but there wasn't actually like a – girls league and footy right like so when you would go and play locally like you would basketball as a as a girls league but not with footy how did like mm. how did you have the confidence or the like how did, how did you do that I would like to know T- talk to me <laughs> um so weird so I think as I grew up um women's footy started to grow mm-hmm. so I was sort of like right there and I was really fortunate to be in that position um I was only girl in my whole league at one point and then Fast forward like four years, there's like girls' teams in that league. Yeah. So I went off and played like youth girls. So I was like 14 playing 18 years and under because there was not that many girls that they had to make the age yeah. massive. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, went and did that and then all of a sudden um, I think I – it was like time for the draft. So there's this AFL Academy yeah. and there's like a bunch of girls around the country that will probably get drafted that do this thing for a week or two. And that was when it started to grow. So 2017 AFLW became a thing. Yeah. There was all these girls getting drafted, all these like older women, not too old but old enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, then the year I came in, there started to be like junior teams. Yeah. My um, local football team finally uh, had a under-18s team and now they have like three under-10s teams yeah. all the way up to senior women's. Like it's insane. So I didn't really get that opportunity but I am grateful that I got to play with guys. So I think that sort of it helped made me you. play the way I do. Yeah. Um, but it's just amazing to see how women's footy just progressed so quickly. Like as soon as AFLW came in, they promoted it really well. Yeah. Um, they've, you know, we've got a lot of people supporting us and getting people on board as well. So I think that helped the game grow and now we've got – Grass, we've got roots. So yeah. starting from Auskick all the way through, there's a pathway. Um, and I think I was sort of like a part of those girls that started to make a little pathway, like yeah. the girls that got drafted in 2018. I think we started that off, which was really exciting. So I got, yeah, lucky you were in that age. You were a trailblazer in that area. Like you, like to say that you kind of made the pathway is really <laughs> underselling yourself. Like I, I think about um, – I mean, like I've watched you throughout your like footy career as well. Like you've you really created that pathway for those younger women and girls that are able to do that now. Like those those pathways didn't exist when you were going through it, and the people before it didn't exist. And I, I think of the people that have created um, and made footy for what it is. Like that 
the people that were in your age group and you, you're one of the huge reasons that we can even like recognize AFLW for what it is now and those grassroots junior programs. And like, I'm, I'm blowing your head up right now because I, I truly, <laughs> I truly believe it. And I, but I like talk me through, did you ever have moments of like doubt and I don't know, maybe call it anxiety or when you're in these pathways that no one's ever done it before and you're surrounded by guys in a league that uh, isn't made for you, what was that like? Like did you feel like you were just pushing shit uphill at some points or were you always so determined and vigilant knowing that there was going to be an outcome? Talk me through that. So I think I'm in a position where I always had an outlet. So with sport so if footy didn't turn out I always had my basketball and if basketball didn't turn out I could look to my football yeah but I think the term pushing stuff uphill yeah um I think the only time where we don't feel like we're doing that is now like leading into the next season it's like if you support us you support us if you don't want to be a part of it then go away sort of thing instead of trying to get everybody included yeah um so the only time I really had like anxiety about that was when I was in a basketball team where um, I didn't have that support of playing football from my coach or I guess from anyone except yeah. my family and friends. Yeah. So that was the only time where I really wasn't sure what to do and I was really doubting um, the future of AFLW. I was like if we have if I don't have the people like around me supporting me in football, then no one else is going to be supporting it. It's going to be going nowhere. Why am yeah. I wasting my time? I should just focus on my basketball. Yeah. So that was probably the only time I really had any doubt. But then um like I said before, it had the right um people promoting the game, the right people involved to the point where it just grew and grew and grew. So there was a little bit of d- a little bit of doubt my first two seasons, but um it's just grown since then. So you sort of just have to be optimistic with it all. Yeah. And if people don't want to watch it and people don't support it, then they can just go home, yeah, honestly. Go away. <laughs> Literally go, go, leave, go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Good so night. Was, yeah. No, I understand that. And I think that for people listening to understand what it's like to be a professional athlete but then also – times that by two to be a dual sport athlete. Like we talk about, you know, that's just a brief history of you as a footy player, right? The history of you as a basketball player is just as intense. And um, talking about like the pathways that we take through sport, the basketball pathway is very intense. There's lots of camps and uh, tours and uh, like different tournaments and things. And it's just, it's, it's intense and it's all the time. As a kid, did you ever feel like there wasn't enough space for you to explore things outside of sport or you were so like, nah, this is this is where I'm supposed to be, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and t- talking to maybe n- your younger self and other kids that are doing all of the sports, what is your advice to them to keep balance in their lives outside of them as an athlete? Yeah, that's a tough one because <laughs> I definitely fell into a hole where I thought, all I had to my life was my sport and, Mm -hmm. like, that's all I had going for me. So if I didn't make a team, then, like, what do I have? And same as footy, if I wasn't having a good season, like, where would I be next season? What would I be doing? Absolutely nothing. And especially I think it hit me during the first COVID block yeah, where I didn't have my sport and I was just so lost. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know, um, like, who I was as a person. I didn't know like what I actually wanted to be. So I had to sit down and like really think like what is it? Like what do I want to do? What do I want to do post-sport? What happens if I get injured? Touch wood. Yeah. Um, So I really didn't know who I was outside of that and I think I've had a lot of help um, with my psych and um, the well-being people at Richmond to help me like figure out what I want to do. So then I got into studying. So I started studying psychology, funnily enough, loved it at school. Um, So, yeah, I just started doing that and uh, with that I kind of set set aside like time to switch off from sport and just go and do that. And I think I've really found a good way to do that, like completely. Like once I get home I'm not thinking about my footy after training or I'm not thinking about basketball once I get home. Like it's a completely different um, vibe and I love that. Different space completely different space and I think that's healthy like to be able to switch off and you would know as well like not having to um let sport run your life I don't think that's that's one way that's not a healthy way yeah um yeah so 
I guess studying is one thing and thank God I have my puppies because they're so yeah. distracting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, and obviously, you know, having a partner and um, having, you know, good family around me is, and friends as well is a really good way to switch off. So I think they've all helped me um, grow as a person the past couple of years and sort of thanks to COVID for helping me figure yeah, that out. Yeah, right? Like it's it was almost like a concentrated time where it forced you to like kind of look inwards, right? Yeah. And as athletes, I kind of talk about this thing where like – for people that don't have the video, I'll do my best at explaining this. We have our identity as this platform up here and a lot of the time we have the things holding us up is just sport. So it's like a T. Yeah. And when that gets taken away, we're like, whoa, mm. like who are we? And um, to add other support beams to that structure, family, dogs, school, might be art, music, video games for some people, just Whatever, the things yeah. that, that make you more than – you know, just the, the things that you do with your body, um, that really helps you feel like a, I don't know, more of a human and less of like this kind of robot that we're just doing this stuff every day. And I, I want to ask you about, so as you kind of, maybe it was going into COVID or coming out of COVID, <coughs> stepping into the space where you were like, I need to see a psych, was that daunting for you? Like, did you have someone kind of like a mentor or something that was like, hey, maybe do this because it might help you be better? Because I know for a lot of kids and adults, the idea of like seeing a psych to help them with stuff is like terrifying. Yeah. So what was that like for you? I guess it's sort of frowned upon, isn't it? Sometimes? Yeah. Especially with like, I guess the older generation. Yeah. I think if you see a psych, then you're just crazy. Yeah. And it's just definitely not like that, yeah. especially being an athlete like – you need people like that to lean on, professional people to lean on like that. So I initially saw a sports psych because yep. I needed to, um, you know, help with outside pressures, outside noise and yep. everything, all, all that sort of stuff that we always do with every day. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, then the COVID hit and then I was sort of in and out of footy and just, you know, what was happening and then the wellbeing person at Richmond suggested um, seeing the psych for like your life stuff yep. and seeing if you can like – map out you know what the, your future looks like yeah. so you have an understanding of what you want to do and yeah. where you want to be and where you want to go and I was like great idea so it was I guess it wasn't daunting because I'd be seeing a, a sports psych anyway yeah. and I guess being so interested in psychology anyway I knew it wasn't a bad thing yeah. to um, talk to somebody because um, sometimes when you talk to your family and friends, it's not the same because no. you can only say certain things and you yeah. can't, yeah, say too much. So talking to someone completely on the outside really helped. And I guess it's hard to open up to someone you don't really know. Yeah. But once you start doing that, you get really comfortable and it's like a big um, release when yeah, you do like that. Yeah, like a weight. So, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like you're carrying around this like tightness in your chest and when you're finally able to find that person that can help you with that professionally, it's like – yeah oh, I can breathe, yeah. you know, and we do deal with a lot of this um, kind of, what's the word for it, um, negative connotations around seeing a psych and like what you're saying about like, oh, that seeing a psych is just for the crazies, you know, like there's this massive stereotype that it's a negative thing, but I, I, I try my best to encourage not just, you know, the people around me, but when I do kids camps and things like that to – Talk about it like it's like seeing a nutritionist or making sure you're drinking enough water and resting your body and because your mind is the tool that is the most important thing. You know, yeah. taking care of your body is like amazing, but it does nothing if you're not taking care of your mind as well. Um, do, you, do you have defining moments in your career now or looking forward where you think about how your mindset has changed over the last kind of 10 years. And like when we think about those moments, those defining moments that have kind of changed you, can you think of anything in particular? Um, I only just, I think the past um, three, two footy seasons. Yeah. So I talk footy because that has been my main focus the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, that – like I had a time where I like had a really big change in mindset of yeah. how I went about everything. Yeah. And I think it's because I started reading. Yep. Um, I started reading books and just habit books and like um, positive mindset books. Yeah. So I just started reading. I was like, this is a great way to look at things. Yeah. Because um, I didn't see, you know, any use in looking at things in negative ways because like you're wasting your energy essentially, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think after reading and then seeing the sports psych, I just had a completely different change in mindset. And I don't, I can't think of moments where it happened, but I do know that like from the start of, not last season, the season before, from the start of that season to the end of it, I was a completely different player. Yeah. I was a completely different person. Um, I had a different mindset on everything. And I think it's because I started reading and, yeah. and taking time to sit back and look at things in a different way. And I think perspective's everything as well. So Yeah, amen to that. Yeah, I can't think of defining moments, but I do know that from then to now, like a completely different mindset and I'm better for it. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, those books that you, so I, I read, but I'm a fantasy reader. Yeah. So <laughs> a little bit different, like yeah. my, it's like self-help, but with dragons. Um, <laughs> so uh, can you uh, maybe shout out a couple of the books that you did read or podcasts or those things that like, cause you know, the, the idea of wanting to better yourself like that um, to some people is a bit scary to take that first leap. So do you want to yeah. plug any sort of things that you found super, super helpful? Um, two that stand out, um, we've probably read it, I don't know. Oh, no, it's got no dragons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might have read it. We'll see. Um, just Atomic Habits. That was my first yep. book I read, mm-hmm. like my first book I um, completed. Yep. Um, the Energy Bus, which is what our whole Richmond team had to read and it was great, so easy to read. And um, I think it's just called Mindset. Mm-hmm. But it was actually really good to read because there's like different stories from different people and all that sort of stuff. So those three are probably my favorite books. I love that. I, mm. I really do. And I guess I'm I'm not sure if it, if this question is as valid now in this current day and age as it would have been if I asked you a couple years ago. Representation in the sporting world for female athletes. I want to ask you about, you know, you've seen it in basketball and you've seen it in footy and what 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 do you feel like is the current state of the way that people view female athletes and where as a society as a whole we can do better yeah. in that space i think there's still so many people out there that view women playing sport badly mm-hmm. and negatively i think we have so much to do in that space especially in basketball oh, yeah. like we could sit here all day I and know. talk about I that know. but we'd probably get cancelled i know <laughs> i know um i yeah it's gone a long way and i think it's thanks to um those type of sports that have created history essentially yep. like i can speak for aflw yeah the 94 percent pay rise yeah like That's essentially if I wasn't playing basketball, that'd be my job, just playing sport, playing football. And I think it doesn't sit well with people that females can play sport for a living or can do sport for a living, however you want to say that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's amazing where we've come. And, yeah, to be able to even say that, like I think, what, 10 years ago we would probably not believe ourselves if we said we'd be playing basketball for a living or football. So we've come a long way but I really think we've got so much work to do and we need the right people to support us in that as well. And I think – yeah, like I said, we could sit here all day and talk about that. Honestly. So, yeah. Honestly. And I – so little background, I um, – this season is my first year not working while I play sport. And that's crazy considering, you know, I've, I've been in the league for five seasons now. I've played over in the WNBA. Like I've, I've had a lot of experience. It's my first year not working. I didn't Um, know that. Yeah. This is my first year not working. And I, yeah, go me. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, and I, I think about, um, like the life balance it's been able to create, right? Like we now, um, now there's a lot of women in um, across both leagues that still work and do full-time sport. What can you say um, I would say would be the biggest difficulty that we still face as female athletes? Because, you know, my from my perspective, it's the respect um, from – sometimes even the men in our same profession. Um, but what would you say it's something that you can speak maybe for AFL more definitely more than I can, but what what do you see as something that we're facing and still is the biggest disparity in the the respect that we deserve in our profession? I think you know that you hit the nail on the head with that one, like the respect. Um and I think the respect from the people that are high up, like in our sport yeah so the people that I guess are running it and that are in charge I think we need 
either like new people to bring new perspective to those type of people yeah. or um, for those people to be more open-minded to yeah. the fact that, you know, we do have really strong, talented female athletes coming through trying to, you know, create a path and trying to, and trying to um, sort of make a statement for female athletes everywhere. So we need the respect that we deserve and also with our own like male athletes in that sport. So for AFL players and NBL players, I think – like even to come to watch our games, that to mm -hmm. um, post a story mm -hmm. of when we're playing, it's not hard. Yeah. It's so easy. It's so simple. And I get it. Maybe they don't want to, but like I'm sure that it's not going to make them get paid less if yep. they post a story mm -hmm. or come to a game. Like, mm -hmm. And you know what? They'd probably enjoy it if they did. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, just having the support and respect that we deserve is probably where we need to start. And that not just for, um, I guess, the male players in our sport, but for the people higher up that are making um, the decisions on behalf of us, I think they need to hear us more and they need to, yeah, be open to more ideas to help us grow our game. I really love that because I 100% agree. I really do. And the the, I, the 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 point behind having a voice, right, like because a lot of the time we feel like we don't mm -hmm. and it's really hard to feel heard in a space that's corporate or male-dominated and it, it's difficult for us. Do you know um, when the point was when you were like, hey, if I speak, maybe I'll be heard or do you feel like when – you're still not there yet. Like when did you find your voice, I guess, to speak out about not just, you know, the topic that we're talking about now but to be able to go to a coach, to someone in your organisation, to a teammate? Like when did you find your voice to stand up for yourself? I think we're, I'm still finding it. So yeah. I think like we have our voice but it's a matter of like where, who do we talk to mm -hmm. and when's the right time to do it? How do we do it without um, being frowned upon? Yep. Um, so I think I'm still finding that because there's so many things I want to say and yep. like you two that you want to say but you got to be careful who you say it to and when you say it as well, mm -hmm. as well right? So I think I'm still finding that like so many ideas and so many things I want to tell people and everything like that. So I'm sort of waiting for the right time, the right platform to be able to do that yep. um, without, um, yeah, without I guess being bashed for it. Yeah. <laughs> So, it's yeah, interesting sure because it. I think about um, maybe, I don't know if it's just because we are so heavily reliant on contract to contract because it's still not like, you know, equal to our male counterparts in terms of pay. So because we're so reliant on that, we don't want to step on any toes and therefore we don't want to speak out against certain things and I think that kind of sometimes creates like a ripple effect of stress of like just wanting to stay in our lane stay in our box yeah. and it can mean that we allow um people to put us into little categories and like just do what's asked of you um I'd, I'd love to see us get to a space where we're able to kind of speak freely act freely and then you know, not have the repercussions of just looking like a perfect little lady in sport. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. I, I mean, I digress, but I, I, <laughs> moving on, I want to ask about how you turn your brain off after big sporting events. Cause you know, one of the biggest questions that we get through like Instagram and things like that is like, Oh, what are your tips for turning your brain off post event? Or how do you yeah. bounce back after? So Mon Conti, <laughs> tell us, how do you turn your brain off after a big event? And what are your biggest tips to kind of like switch down, um, after maybe you feel like you haven't performed as well as you could have? Um, it's taken me a very long time to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, still working on it. Yeah. Because um, we're our biggest hip uh, biggest critics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're our biggest critic. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess I always think about it as like it's a future mom problem. Yeah. <laughs> so if I don't have a good game, it's like okay, what like what can I do about it? Like yeah. I can't sit there and think about it. I can't sit there and watch the game over and over and just hate it mm -hmm. um so I yeah I just think about it like that like I'll think okay well um tomorrow I'll reassess and then at training I can just work on what I need to work on so mm -hmm. I also have the mindset because of all the books I've read yes <laughs> all um, of these books yeah I've just sort of got the mindset that um like you can't take back the past like what can you do about it sort of thing so 
um, yeah, on to the next. I'm really good at um, thinking on to the next. So then I come home and have, yeah, my schnitzels and then um, get into bed and then wake up the next day and then start thinking about it. So I really don't know what it is that I do, but I think like you can't just take back the past. You can't go back and do it all again. So you just got to focus on the positives and what you can do next sort of thing. Yeah. I guess like that is a really good segue because I just, um, when I was talking to Kayla George about this the other day where we were talking about um, always having the pressure of the next thing, right? Mm -hmm. So like going on from what you said, as athletes, um, we are always – there, there, there's no real off time. And so we're always trying to focus on the next and living in this like high pressure environment, I guess. How do you balance the pressure and the drive to try and be great and on to the next with like not overwhelming yourself with, oh my God, on to the next? You know, <laughs> like yeah. it's a do- double uh, bladed question, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. That is tough, hey. Yeah. Um, I guess so with my football, I guess I have a – it's really – I think it's a lot harder to do that mm-hmm. because of um, my own expectations and, you know, coaches' expectations, parents' expectations, everything like that. So um, I think leaning on people, like leaning on my sports psych or leaning on people that I trust and sort of just talking about it, whatever's mm-hmm. on my mind, that is a massive help. Um, And obviously the same with the basketball. Like if you don't, if you just sort of bottle it up and you put all the pressure internally onto yourself, like you're never going to get any better. You're just going to put more stress on on yourself, which will obviously then affect your performance. So I think just leaning on people and talking to them about whatever it is that it may be could be directly related to the game or it could be related to the next game or anything like that. Um, Yeah, just talking about it and, yeah, leaning on your support network, which is probably something that I do that, helps me, I guess, yeah. focus on the next without um, being so scared of it. Yeah. And that support network um, and, like, the importance of what that is, I guess, you have a partner that also plays professional sport. You want to give him a shout-out? <laughs> shout-out, Devo. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Um, I mean, I know from my uh, experience my partner also plays professional sport, but how do you guys balance and bounce off each other both playing such a high level of professional sport? I guess it's actually a great thing because you can understand each other so well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can you can feel um you can feel comfortable in going to them about your sport problems. Yeah. Um, because they understand. And I it's it's so nice. It's such a great feeling. And especially when you know that we can bounce off someone that you're so close to as well and they can provide you with brutally honest feedback yep. or just be there to hear you out and just listen to you. It's like it's a really good feeling. It's really comforting and it goes both ways as well, hearing how um, he's had to deal with things and how he and the stuff that he's had to go through as well and I'm here um, able to hear that and listen to him and I guess, um, yeah, we can really understand each other. So it's, yeah, a very special relationship yeah. that you can have to be with someone that is in like similar, in a similar field as well. So it's it's really awesome. So shout out Wiggity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shout out Wiggity. Um, no, I totally agree with that. It yeah. does, like it is amazing because it means that like you don't have to over-explain certain things. Yes, um, that too. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I think I have said this in another episode, but I was um, talking to one of my friends who is a makeup artist who doesn't really understand sport and I was like oh I was telling her a situation she's like oh my god did you go to HR and I was like "Uh, (laughs) there is no HR (laughs) I would love to say there is like uh, but no you know like and so we don't have to over explain those things (laughs) bless Georgia you're great um I do yeah (laughs) I do think that's great um we do um as high functioning people um like that drive and the the reason like because you don't just get up every day with like without a purpose right so what is your why like why do you do what you do every day if you can break it down like some people can't answer that question but what is your why so funny that you asked that I've been working on my why for like nearly a whole year now I'd say or like a couple years I don't know um and I'm still trying to find it. It's yeah. so difficult to it pinpoint, is. especially when your life's been like this the whole yeah. time. Um, 
So I don't really know how to answer that perfectly, but uh, yeah, I'm still figuring that out and I'm really keen to figure it out as well because I want to I want to be able to answer that question when someone asks me, like, what's your why? And like, here's my why. Yeah. So I'm um, on my journey to figure that out and I'm excited to. Um, and I think there's so many reasons as to why I do what I do, but there's, yeah, I'm still on that journey. It's hard to, to pinpoint, that out. right? Yeah, it is really It hard. is important, right, because it means that once you figure out your why, it, it gives you more depth yep. to what we're doing every day. It doesn't feel so. On the days where it's extra bloody hard, there's this extra level of depth that you can peel back to like, oh, okay, well, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it, it also means that you don't um, – you know, we have these high highs and these low lows. And at the end of the day, having a solid why can kind of balance you out in the middle. Yeah. And I, I think that it's so underrated as, as a factor in professional sport. Like that should be one of the first things that we're taught. Yes. Um, yes. like it, when we enter a professional league, um, outside of sport, would you say you have any goals that you're looking forward to, whether that be personal, business, family, um, that you could share with us? Um, I want to finish my psychology degree Mm -hmm. um, and I want to eventually become a counsellor for, I don't know yet, but a counsellor for something. So I'm trying to figure out like where my interests lie and like, you know, maybe I'll help some communities, maybe I'll help kids, like I don't know yet. Um, And... I want to keep growing my profile, like my personal profile, because I believe that post-sport, if we have a big enough profile, then we can get um, a lot of things coming in for us as well, which is obviously good financially. You've got to um, set yourself up that way. Yeah. Um, So that's probably my only two at the moment. Like I still feel like I'm quite young, so I'm still trying to find myself properly and see what I actually want to do because right now um, I've just got those goals and I have like, I guess, short-term goals and I try and tick those off first and then when I have time to sort of sit back and think about my future is when I'll set some new goals for myself. So I'm in that process. Yes, eh? yes. I mean, you are young. We are young. young, (laughs) We are very young. Um, So that going through that process of figuring out who you are, right, that's sometimes that's a process that usually isn't documented and people don't aren't able to see that. But as someone who is in the media's eye, how do you feel like there's a certain expectation of you just trying to figure yourself out or do you ever feel like um you can't fully make as many mistakes as you want to um do you ever feel that kind of media pressure or not so much I think um it's sort of easier Mm -hmm. um being a female in sport Mm -hmm. because we don't get as much attention as maybe we should yeah um compared to like guys so if like we were men in our position um we'd probably have to be a bit more careful with what we say but yes I do feel that pressure because there's like some things that I think we said this before, some things that you want to say that you've got to mm-hmm. be careful um, because of um, how you think people are going to perceive you. Yeah. So I guess the media only sees what it wants to see and mm-hmm. only so much of you and the people around you and that are closest to you and that have seen you grow up are probably the only people that really know me truly as a person. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, have you heard of the term tall poppy syndrome? What does that actually mean? Okay. <laughs> okay. So there's this thing in Australian all. sports, um, where, and I'm sure it's in other sports around the world, but I think it's mostly used as a term here in Australia where the people that are succeeding, um, everyone else tries to cut them down. So the, the poppies <sighs> underneath the little poppies trying to cut down the small poppies. Um, so that's tall poppy syndrome. And I, I have experienced this in in my past two years. Um, have you experienced and how do you deal with feeling or experiencing other people trying to bring you down? I think being athletes, you're always going to have people that don't want you to succeed. And then if you do, they want to be your friend. Yeah. And they want to say, I was there the whole time. Yay, yep. it's all me, you know? Yeah. Um, I... I guess um, I don't know. It's hard. It is hard because with me, I kind of just jump over those yeah. people like, yeah. go away, yeah. stay out. Dubai. Yeah. I think, yeah, I try and keep um, my inner circle, my inner circle. Yeah. And I don't really expand too far because mm-hmm. you can't make friends with the wrong people yeah. because there's going to be people that 
we want to be your friend and we want to be by your side, but really um, do want to make sure that you don't succeed. So yeah. I really don't know how to answer that question, but just try and, I guess, keep my head down and just try and reach the goals that I want to reach. And yeah. if they want to be there with me, they can. If they don't, they don't. Like it's really, yeah. what about you? Well, I've <laughs> I've always been under the impression um, or the, the, the viewpoint that, we should, especially as females in sport, try and build each other up as much Amen. as we can. Yeah. It should always be about building each other up and we should never try and tear another female in sport down ever. Ever. Across sports, not just basketball and footy, but in general, like the the idea of tearing a female down, especially when we've had to do so much work to get to where we are, um, is just baffling to me. So I think um, I, str- I really struggle personally with um, – feeling that kind of tall poppy syndrome and I've had some really ugly experiences with people trying to tear me down um, and I've really, really let them get to me, especially in the last year. Um, I've really, I've, I've let that put me into that dark place and I think that I think the thing that pulls me out of it is knowing that if I can do my best to pull other people up around me, then I can prevent other people from having to feel what I did. Yeah. And that kind of helps raise, I don't know, it, it also makes me think that I'm raising the bar for the standard of how we treat each other and I would never, ever, ever in a million years try and tear someone down next to me. But if because of my experience with it, I'm trying to overly build up the people around me so we can create a space where – there's no room for that in yes. – I, I mean, I have the – I only have the experience with women's basketball, but I would like to say eventually there's no room for that in women's sports. And I know that we're competitive yep. and we are ferocious and determined, but that doesn't mean that we have to be awful. Mm. I believe that – you know, I use this example of – shout out Sarah Blitzars. We go at birthday, each – yeah, happy birthday, Sarah. <laughs> we go at each other on the basketball court, absolutely at each other, but – we build each other up off the court yeah. and as soon as you leave the court it's like high fives love you you know like that's that is the environment i want not only for us professional athletes but for the younger kids growing up because how nasty can girls sports teams get very oh my very god nasty. Yeah. we don't like that's something we haven't even spoken about like that's it can be awful and we lose so many quality athletes at such a young age to just bad culture yeah. To bad culture, bad environment. And I guess my question to you is what is what is something that you feel like you can do to improve that in your not just maybe maybe your sport, but then also for the younger kids in AFLW? What is your advice to them and what do you, how are you going to lead by example in that space? I think um, exactly what you said, like you just got to build up the people around you and you got to really, I guess, set the bar. Yeah. Um, and set the tone for that because there's no space to tear people down. And like what what does that benefit anyone anyway in yeah. doing that? Um, you probably get more out of um helping the people around you, helping them grow as people and as athletes. So yeah. that's probably one way to do it. And I guess like it's it's interesting because I have a younger sister as well. Yeah. So I try and feed that into her. Yeah. Um, it's just the whole positive mindset and like if there's another girl on the court that is playing really well against you credit to them yeah. it's not like oh she this she that like yes. anything. like it's like hang on no it's none of that it's she's a good player well done to her now you got to go and get better yeah you got it and it's more so i think um could get a, give the advice that um for those younger athletes just to focus on themselves yeah. and what they need to do and not worry so much on the person next to you and what they're doing with their life or with their sport or yeah. how they're going about it yeah and yeah, just pat them on the bum, like be yeah. encouraging and focus on yourself because you're on your own journey. Yeah. And you don't need to be tearing anybody down um, in doing that as well. Yeah, 100% agree. I have a last, last couple of questions, but I guess, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll try and I say last couple of questions and I always end up dragging this out. It's but fine. when um, you see yourself as a role model, I'm not sure if you do or not, but you are. Um, when you think about how people see you, do you, is there a disconnect between the way that you are perceived and how you think people see you versus who you actually are? And if there is or if there isn't, how are you trying to make it so you're seen for being Mon and not this version that other people see you as? I Social media is huge, right? Yeah. So I try and be 
who I am on social media because it's just the way it is these days. As much as it sucks, like everybody is using it Mm -hmm. and everybody sees you through that or just the media in general. So I I think I think that I am what people think of me and how they see me on whatever platform it is. I feel like it's the same me when they meet me. Yeah. So I try and not be fake. I try and just um, let my personality show when I'm doing interviews, um, when I'm meeting people the f- for the first time and everything like that. So I don't think there is a difference, um, mm-hmm. like in a good way. Yeah. And I think moving forward, I'm trying to just yeah be myself and not be ashamed of saying whatever I want to say, yeah. um, and just being who I am to yeah. anyone because like I just don't see the point in um, putting this mask on yeah. um, in front of a camera or um, when you're meeting somebody. So hundred percent agree. Think, yeah, yeah, close the gap from where people see you versus who you actually are because yeah. it just makes for more um, like conversations with less barriers and yeah. more genuine interactions and things like that. Yeah. Um, then what would your ad- – advice is a broad word, but what would your kind of advice be to the people who are trying to do more than just one sport who say – um, who have heard this term, pick one and you mm-hmm. can't do both, what is your advice? Um <laughs> I was going to touch on this earlier. I think I hate the fact that there even is like there even are people out there saying to pick one. Like I just don't get it. Yeah. You said before like we should be building up women in sport. Why yeah. are we trying to tell female athletes to pick one thing? Yeah. Like if they're good at two things, go for it. Go yep. and do it. Like I just don't understand. Yeah. I could talk about this all day. Yeah. Um. And like I love the fact that Tess is doing both and she oh, yeah. did both and she's incredible for doing that. And I, yeah, I think that that's just amazing. I think, like, it's really hard to say this, but I feel like players like myself and like Tessa, we've really paved the way for young girls to come through. Like, I've had people come up to me and say, my daughter, like, after basketball games, I'm like, my daughter plays basketball and football too because, like, she wants to be like you, Mon. And I'm like, oh, that is amazing. Yeah. Like, I didn't think that I would ever hear that. Yeah. And I think we've really opened up a b- massive door for yeah. those young girls because there are so many out there that are playing basketball and football. Yeah. And I think it's really, like, even kids younger than that that are doing that, I don't think they know how that even started yeah. or why they even think that that's a thing now. It's because there's players like Tessa and myself and others that have, you know, created that pathway. Yes, absolutely, and, yeah. absolutely. Like you got to you, – you have to recognise the fact that – they're, they're, because of what you and Laves and those other people have done, that won't be a question in a couple of years' time. Mm. The idea of it, no, like the idea of someone being like, I'll oh, pick one, that's not going to be a thing. No. It's only going to be encouraged if that's what you want to do. And you, there should never be a ceiling. Why is there a ceiling? Why do we look at these athletes and say, oh, you must stop here. You no. can't You can't go above that. Like that's blasphemy. Like no, it should be <laughs> that we are encouraging people to succeed in every possible way that they can. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the reason that there was or there is so much like negativity and questioning is because it terrifies people to see excellence in a way that they've never seen it before. Yeah, and it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I think um, I had this situation in my basketball career. I'm not going to say when and who or how, but I had someone I sit me down. <laughs> <laughs> we know this. <laughs> I had someone um, sit me down and say, you can't be – a WNBL player and play professional football, it can't be done. You have to pick and if you don't, if you keep doing both, then you will not be getting on the court or you will never be a good basketball player. And I just laugh. I thought I were joking. Yeah. My mum was there, my manager was there, and I was like, like, did you hear that? Are yeah. you serious right now? And I said, okay. So I just kept – oh, hello. Um, <laughs> I just kept doing what I was doing and, and like, I just – I just never understood it. And yeah. to this point, I was like, um, you know what? I'm going to keep pushing through. And the stuff that I had to go through that I'm sure Tessa has had to go through just as much yeah. um, was insane. Like yeah. the people that did not think that I could do it, yeah. the people that um, were so against us doing it, like 
I kid you not, the stuff like the the mentally draining. Yeah. Oh, I can't even. I can't even. Because that's you. Dra- the the questioning of your ability is yeah. draining. Yeah. It should be the celebration of your ability and not the questioning of yeah. it. That's like, the crazy part. If I do it and I fail, great, I tried. Yeah. But don't try and drag me down and not let me do it in the first place. I yeah. just never understood. So here I am, still doing both, and yeah. he's Tessa, still doing both. So I think. Yeah, I'm just really happy that we've been able to show um, all the younger kids coming through that just do what you're good at and do what you love and make the decision whenever you're ready. You don't even have to make a decision. If you don't want, then don't. (laughs) I love that. I really do. And you've said that like absolutely perfectly because, I mean – God, you, like we fight so many battles as is and it's just so impressive. It's so impressive that not only are you doing both but you're doing both with the disapproval of so many people. It's such a badass thing. Like yeah. it's so <laughs> badass and like Laves is incredible. Like we last year um, – uh, Tessa Levy played the AFLW season and the WNBL season at the same time. I just didn't understand. At I the was same like, time. <laughs> yeah. And that, like, I I challenge mm-hmm. our male counterparts <laughs> to play NBL and AFL and tell me how tired you were and she yeah. never missed a beat. No. And she'd just come off an Olympics. You Might wouldn't, I just add that? You wouldn't yeah. even know that she was doing it because no. of how she went about it. And like yeah. the positive mindset is insane. But I'm sure like she's had to go make some sacrifices, yeah. I guess, Absolutely. with the national team as well in order to do that. Yeah. So like credit to her and yeah, to pave in that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, really, like you've opened, like what you said, you've opened a door to all these new opportunities and it's not just footy and basketball. It could be volleyball and soccer. Anything. Could be, um, we see lots of cross coders like soccer, cricket, all these yeah. things. And it is really amazing. Like there is so many talented people coming through the ranks now that are like, you know what, if I can do both, I'm going to do both. Yeah. And like stuff you. Like Speaking of dual athletes, um, do you think you will give footy a go? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for this question. Um, I have thought about it. I've also been offered. Um, the thought for me, Mon, and talk me through this, mm-hmm. you're running. <laughs> Correct. You're running. A very long time. And the ball changes directions. <laughs> so in my head, I'm like, I've tried kicking. I'm, I'm not great at that. And then I, I, it's the running and the trying to pick it up as I'm running part that gets me yeah. every time. Like I've gone and had a kick with um, my brother and my partner and um marina's naturally very talented or whatever she wants to do and then i just try and pick up the ball and it just i read it that's like i have a 50 50 chance of picking which way it's going to go and i picked the wrong day <laughs> from the wrong direction every single time um but um you know i i hear on the grapevine <clears throat> marina whittle might be giving aflw a try do it <clears throat> Any clubs that are interested, I'll just plug <laughs> Marina there. Um, she's thinking about it. For me, I, love that. I don't think I'm coordinated enough. It's fine. Um, and maybe one day. I'm never going to say no. You're really good at rebounding, which means marking and yes. reading in the air. Yeah. Just give it's it It's the crack. landing part. You've seen me on the floor 90% of the True. time. It's the landing. But it's grass, so it's a lot yeah. easier to land. Yeah, that's what everyone says. But we'll see. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave that door open in that space. Yeah, why not? Also, um, last, last, second last question. Um, <laughs> is there anything that people don't know about you? And can you tell us a fun little fact? Um, this is like the question that, is asked like tell us three things yeah, about yeah, yourself yeah. before yeah, yeah you're in a new team well. yeah. <laughs> um, something fun we've had a couple of people tell us that they can dance um, oh do you no wanna, I can't I, <laughs> <laughs> I could not tell you that because I'd be lying <laughs> um, I I don't have anything fun I have like an addiction to olives. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm interjecting this. I'm interjecting this. When we were in Italy. You would know. If you know, you know. Oh, my God. When we were in Italy for the under-19s and uh, the under-19 world champs for basketball, um, Mon ate so many olives. Like we would have a plate of food and then Mon would have a whole nother size plate 
of olives uh-huh. and in yep. her in her room she would have all her snacks and <laughs> olives <laughs> no shame no shame i have no shame no shame no yeah. shame but yeah that's a good fun fact that's so funny that just like yeah. that makes my brain kind of um yeah <laughs> that, there we go that is so funny that brings you know it's like a certain smell or a sound or something can bring you back to a whole time in your life Uh-oh. i just relived <laughs> I just relived Uh-oh. that whole under 19s tournament I'm in sorry. 15 seconds. <laughs> Apology. Though, yeah. Apology accepted. Yeah. Um <laughs> that is I guess that's a fun fact it if is. you didn't know. Um I oh, I don't know, that's it. <laughs> no, I like that. I think that's um, good. I think between that and reading the dictionary, yeah. <laughs> I think that really I think that those are two pretty fun facts that work pretty well. Can't top that one. No, no, not at all. Okay, so um, the last thing I'll ask is moving forward, looking into your long future because the thing is is like people might not recognise is like A, you're still so young and there's so much more of your career ahead of you in whatever it is that you want to do. What is – if any, do you have any goals looking forward? They don't have to be in sport. They can be in life. But what are the things that you think um, are looking forward towards? Might be short term, might be long term. I am looking forward short term to having a bit of a break, yep. if I'm honest. Yep. Um, I haven't had one in a minute. So that's very short, short term mm-hmm. after this season. Um I'm just, I don't know, like I'm very much, this could be a fun fact, I'm very much a day-by-day person. So I don't like putting too much pressure on myself to do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I I guess a long-term goal would be the psych stuff, like finishing that off because I think that'd be a huge achievement for myself. Oh, yeah, um, Considering juggling like sport. And a Um, uni degree, like that's incredible. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that's probably... The next two, I want to travel eventually. I don't know yeah. if you even asked that question, but no. Um, I guess that's a goal. I want to be yeah. able to do something in my life that doesn't revolve around my sport. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just being so young, yeah, we've got so many things that we can do and achieve, and I think that's exciting. So yeah, hopefully my five year plan is pretty cool, but I'll um, assess that real soon. Yes, I love that for you. We love that for you. Um, well, Mon. Thank you so much for coming on here and talking random crap for the last <laughs> hour. No, it's been really amazing. And to hear your perspective on a lot of things, I haven't been able, I haven't spoken to anyone who does what you do. And I think that I'm excited for young kids to listen to this um, because there really is like so much power in the conversation that um, we are limitless. Like there, there should be no no limits on what we're able to achieve and what to do and you are a human embodiment of that and you continue to do that every day which inspires like not just you know the younger generation but the athletes around you like you know me all the girls on my team on your team everyone watching you uh is inspired just by the way that you go about your business every day and it's absolutely incredible and so for that i wanted to say thank you (laughs) so much for coming on here today and we will definitely get you back in a couple weeks with your sausages on (laughs) there i would really love that i have Um, a lot to say yeah Yeah. i feel like they would also have a lot to say um but yes thank you so much mon um this is under the surface with annalee mailey and this was monique conti (laughs) do i say anything you can say thank you (gasps) thank you thank you for having me and annalee you're an amazing human don't forget that oh thanks (laughs) one cut we out